You grew up in Jefferson, Georgia. Can you tell us what that was like? I still live in the same town I grew up in. Um, I just never felt compelled to leave. I left for college and then came back to where all my friends and family are, to where I feel at home and feel like myself. So, yeah, I like that my kids are going to grow up there and go to the same school that I went to. And my family is really important to me, so I'm happy to stay close to there. Um, you grew up living with your grandmother. What kind of influence did that have on you? Yeah, I, I bounced around a little bit, but all through high school I lived with my grandma. And it was nice, it was just me and her. Uh, she cooked home cooked meals every night. And you know, she, I had a lot of respect for my grandmother. She taught me a lot about integrity and hard work and doing what it takes to support your family. And she was a huge influence on me, still is. Does that um, influence your music at all? I think so. I think that my music has a real sense of place and it, it's grounded. Uh, probably because uh, of that experience there. It's one of the reasons I, I guess I'm still in Jefferson. It's just part of who I am. And before you had your career in music, you were a teacher. Yeah. So can you tell me a little bit about your decision to be a teacher? Yeah, yeah, when I was a teenager, I guess I had the pipe dream of being a rock star or something. And then you know, I kind of got my priorities straight and I realized that what was more important to me was having stability and security and family. And so, um, I decided to, to take my education seriously and um, become a teacher because I felt like it was a, a way of having a positive impact on the community and giving back. Um, I was passionate about social studies. So, um, yeah, it was, a, it was a really good experience. I taught high school at one point in high school outside of Atlanta for four years. And it was a tough decision to leave, but I, I felt like the, the opportunity to play music might not always be there. Uh, and I could always go back to teaching. You seem to have a very strong sense of home. Why do you think you connect with Jefferson, Georgia so much when at a younger age, um, you, on your website, you quote going to Paris and wanting to get out a little bit, but now you seem to have that strong sense of being at home? I, I think part of the college experience is learning about the world outside of where you're from. Uh, I really enjoyed going to Paris, for example, just seeing what else was out there and, and experiencing different ways of life. Um, but, but ultimately, when it, when it comes to where I wanted to raise my family, I, I felt like I lived in a great place where uh, people care about each other and, and take care of each other. And yeah, there's a lot of drama that goes along with it, but I, I wouldn't trade that. You said on your website, listening to the Allman Brothers and Leonard Skinner got you through the difficult time when you were in Paris. What things do you listen to and how have they influenced you musically? Well, I mentioned that in my bio because it, it was really important time for me. You know, there's the saying, absence makes the heart go fonder. And when I was uh, when I was in, in Europe for that summer, I, I was, uh, I got really homesick. You know, I enjoyed being there and experiencing a, a new culture, but it, it really made me, it gave, it gave me a new perspective on my home and music was certainly part of that. And, and, and you know, listening to a band like the Almond Brothers, just, it, it had the ability to take me back. Um, and I, I think music still has that power. You know, when I'm on the road, I can put in certain records that just put me in a good mood, whether it's uh, Randy Newman or Paul Simon or, or John Mayer. I like, I like John Mayer a lot. Um, or, you know, I like, I like Eric Church a lot, Zach Brown Band. Um, you know, I like the Black Keys. I, 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 I like a lot of different types of music. Um, it just depends on what mood I'm in. Why did you choose to release your albums independently? That was really the only way. I, I mean, it, it, I guess necessity is the mother of invention. Um, so I, I just wanted to get my music out to people. I put out my first three albums when I was still teaching high school. So I would play bar games on the weekend and make a little extra money, and I would use that money to make my records. Uh, and I never even thought of it as a releasing an album independently. I was just making a record and selling it to my friends and family. And they spread the music around. And, and fortunately, uh, you know, MySpace was, was huge at the time, so that really helped get the music out there. Um, it was really, it's just a blessing that I am where I am. It wasn't because I had some sort of game plan or, or business strategy. It was just, it just happened. And I, I feel, I feel blessed and I feel responsible to, you know, to take it as far as I can because I feel like it's destiny I want. How do you feel about the industry for independent artists today, especially since the rise of social media? You mentioned MySpace. I think that technology is level the playing field where now people who make music have access to the marketplace in a way that they didn't even 10 or 15 years ago. Uh, and consumers have more choice than they ever had. Um, there's still a lot to be said for mainstream media uh, and, and you know, radio in particular is, is 
still extremely valuable if you want to reach the masses, but now there's all these different levels. Where, where before in music, it was sort of, you had the winners and you had the losers. You had the, the big stars and then you had the people who were really struggling. Now there's this whole new class of musicians that are almost like a middle class of artists that can go out on the road and, and still make money and continue to develop as artists. And I, I think really, I, I would rather do it that way than have overnight success by going and, and being sort of manicured to be a, to be an artist. Uh, really, it takes years, if not a lifetime, to find out who you are as an artist and, and express yourself. And I think sometimes, because big business needs to turn a profit quickly, they take a lot of shortcuts with artists uh, to, to get them you know, out and sell product uh, where, where technology made it, and especially programs like Kickstarter, they make it where an artist can be an artist they can connect with fans and gradually develop, and it, mean, it means they're gonna make mistakes and they're gonna make some bad records. I've made bad records, but it's all part of it. You know, you have to make mistakes in order to grow. A few of your songs, including one by the title Fuck the Popo, address previous interactions with the police. Another song, Chattanooga, addresses the concept of protection under the First Amendment and freedom of speech. Why did you choose to write about the concept of freedom of speech? I don't know, maybe it's the social studies teacher in me. But, but when I wrote Fuck the Pope, I wasn't trying to make a statement about free speech. I was just pissed off. And I, you know, that's my job as an artist is to express myself. And it came out that way. And when I wrote it, I expected that I would play it for my friends and family. I had no idea that I was going to be playing it all over the country and have everybody flicking the police off and stuff, you know. But, you know, it's, it, I was just sort of doing my job. And in, in Chattanooga, it, it was the first time, or one of the first times that I felt like, I was being in intimidated because of the content of my song, and, and I really thought about it in a, in a First Amendment in a way where you know, I had a room full of adults who had paid for a ticket who were told that they couldn't hear a song, and, and I felt like that was just a slap in the face to the First Amendment. As an artist, I have the right to be critical of authority. That's what's great about America, is we can criticize the people who are enforcing the laws. And that, whether it's justified or not, it, it's that right is fundamental to, to a free society. Um, you support the SEBA, SEBA Foundation, and Be the Change International. Can you tell me a little bit about these two organizations and what your relationship with them is? Well, Be the Change International is actually based here in Jacksonville. Uh, I met uh, Dr. Robert Lee, who heads that organization, years ago when I, when I was just starting out, and he was drawn into a, a song called Be the Change that I wrote a long time ago, and I've just become great friends with him and, and the organization. Uh, the, the organization started as Fresh Ministries, which did, did a lot of economic development work here in Jacksonville, uh, and they decided to, to branch out on a global scale. Um, in particular, they do a lot of work in Sub-Saharan Africa um, on HIV and AIDS uh, prevention, research, and treatment, and so I was able to go to South Africa with them and learn a lot about what they do. Uh, so that, that was certainly a cause that I was happy to get behind. But they do a lot of work in Haiti now, uh, and it's just, it's a great organization that's out there trying to change the world, you know, as much as they can. It's, it's an ongoing struggle. Uh, SEVA is uh, another, uh, you know, global nonprofit, and they specialize in eye care, uh, eye treatment. Um, you know, I, I don't have the best eyesight in the world, I don't have to go into my, my struggles with, with eyesight, but uh, it was a cause that was important to me, and I found out about them uh, through my business manager, and, and in particular what SEVA does is they're able to go into developing countries and provide eye care at an extremely low cost, uh, especially like cataract surgery. Uh, here in the States, it's thousands of dollars, and it's usually, a, it's usually a hospital stay. I guess you can do it outpatient in some cases, but they can actually do a, a cataract surgery for 50 bucks. And there's thousands, probably tens of thousands, I don't know the statistics, but there, there's a lot of people out there who can't see, and they just need a $50 surgery, and they can get their sight back. And so I found out about their program and wanted to be involved. And uh, I went to Guatemala with them a few years ago and uh, learned a lot more about them. So I hope as, as my career grows and I can be more valuable to, to the causes that, that I find meaningful. And you know, I, I hope that I can continue to do that. Your music has some variants in style. Do you ever feel pressured to stay in the box of a certain genre? Yeah, certainly. Uh, I, I try to not pay attention to it, but um, yeah, in, in particular, in trying to reach a, a radio audience, uh, there, there's the need to sort of fit, fit into this mold. I think that my music is 
already there without trying to do that. It, especially in the country music format, I've seen it change so much over the past 10 years. When I first started out, I was like, well, I'll never be on the radio. So, you know, I, I didn't even think about it or consider it. Uh, but as the format's changed over the past 10 years, you know, my music can fit right in there. Um, but I, I feel like, again, I have a, a, a conscience that guides me when I'm, when I'm writing songs and when I'm in the studio, and I just try to do what feels natural to me and not worry about what the preconceived notions are. And if it's meant for, for me to have a big hit song on the radio, then I, I would be blessed and, and grateful. If not, I'm already blessed and grateful. What do you like about touring? I love the, the being on stage is, is certainly what it's all about. Um, especially cer certain nights where everything is just right, where you feel you feel like you're as big as the whole room because you can hear the audience and you can, you can feel that they're connecting. I, I think one thing people get out of my shows that they don't get out of a, a lot of country shows especially is the fact that I've written all the songs that I sing. They've written every word of them and I'm sharing you know, part of who I am with them. So it's, it's, a, it's a really cool thing. I, I think that the audience leaves feeling like they know me and, and that the show is them getting to know me and all these different sides of me. And it's, it might be a little egocentric, but it's the only way that I know to do it. But that's what it's all about is that hour and a half, two hours on stage. That's the, the, the best time of the day. Tell me about your craziest experience on tour. I've got bit. You know, I've gotten bit twice, actually. I, I got bit in uh, Fayetteville, Arkansas. I was just out there meeting with fans and I was uh, getting my picture made with this lady and she was really drunk and she reached over and bit me. Like, drew blood. <laughs> so I had a big bite mark I had to explain to my wife. Like, You're not going to believe this, <laughs> but I actually got bit. Yeah. Are there any venues that you would consider a favorite? No, I try not to look at it like that. There's certainly some nights that are just really special. Um, but I, I try to keep an even keel, maybe like an athlete would. You know, you don't want to get too high or too low uh, and be happy every night and, and, and try to play the same way. That said, you know, playing the Grand Ole Opry was, was amazing. It was an amazing experience. You know, going back home and playing in Athens, uh, in Athens at the Georgia Theater at the Classic Center is always amazing. Playing um, Chastain Park in Atlanta, Verizon Wireless in, in, in Atlanta is great. Uh, the Tennessee Theater we played in, in the Tennessee Theater we played in Knoxville a few weeks. That place is awesome. The pageant in St. Louis is great. It's always great to go play in New York. Um, I mean, there's the 9:30 Club in D.C., Joe's Bar in Chicago. I mean, I can go on and on. Uh, King's Ballroom in Tulsa. There, there's all sorts of great places out there to play music. And, you know, that those places make it possible for, for artists like myself to, to have a career. So, why did you choose to come to UNF? I was invited. <laughs> yeah. Have you played here before? I've played Jacksonville a ton of times, um, but I've never played here on the campus before. Are there any venues that you haven't played that you want to play in the future? I'd love to play Red Rocks out in Colorado. I'd love to play the Fox Theater in Atlanta. Um, you know, without getting too ambitious, I'm, probably, I'm not going to say any more. <laughs> Looking back on your career, how would you say you feel about where you are right now? I feel like I'm in a good spot. Uh, creatively, um, I'm in the best place I've ever been. Um, uh, the, the past few years, I've, I've written a ton of songs. We're in the studio right now trying to finish this record. I'm working on a record now with a producer named Keith Stegall, who produced all the Alan Jackson records, all the Zach Brown band records. He's worked with George Jones and Merle Haggard and Randy Travis. And it's the first time I've ever been able to work with a producer of that caliber. And it's something that in, in the past I was always afraid of. I was afraid of you know, working with a, a, a producer who made hits. And, and them wanting to change me and want me to co-write and sing other people's songs and do whatever I had to do to fit that mold. Uh, and when I went through the process of finding a producer, I, I met Keith and I knew right away that he was the right guy because as, as an artist himself and a songwriter, he understood me and understood what this is all about for me and uh, didn't come in and change things. He just got us in a room comfortable uh, with, with, my, with my band and trying to capture what we do on stage in a controlled environment and make it sound better. Um, and, and fortunately, because I've been writing so much, uh, he, I had 30 or 40 songs uh, to choose from. So he was a, a great asset in going through that material and helping me pick which ones uh, would make the best album. So I, I'm, I'm really excited about that right now. And, uh, you know, focused on getting it finished and getting it out to people. Last question: Your song "I Love Everybody" um, and you know the message of uh, accepting different kinds of people. Do you think this is an important message to spread? Certainly. When I talk, when I uh, 
when I taught social studies, I had a group full of students that were very diverse. Uh, students who just moved in from uh, Laos. Uh, you know, I, I had Muslim students who, whose families were from, you know, from Iran or from Pakistan or Hindu students from India. I had you know, white kids who came from small towns like me. I, I had black kids, I had rich kids, I had poor kids. And you know, I, I learned to love all of them and treat them all equally and not judge them based on you know, how they looked or where they came from or what their religious beliefs were. So yeah, I think tolerance is, is a really important part of you know, who we are as, as a nation. And, uh, that song uh, came from an experience I had up in Kentucky one night where after a show, I went out to a bar and I was meeting fans and stuff. And this kid came up to me, uh, he had been at the show and he was hammered, you know, but he had his hand up to, to give me five. And as he had his hand up, he just started spouting off all these offensive, you know, bigoted remarks. You know, F these people and F these people and F these people. And I kind of pulled my hand back and it made me scratch my head and think, why does this kid think that I would go along with that? Is it because I sing country music? I, mean, I, don't, I don't get it. And the next day I was playing up in Virginia at this amphitheater that was set off in the woods and, and I was walking around and that, that was on my mind. And uh, the idea for I Love Everyone came to me. And yeah, it's the, the first time I played it, I was kind of nervous. I didn't know how it was going to be received. You know, most of my fans are, are white, white people from the South. Uh, but not, you know what, I, I take it back. It's not white people from the South. It's white, white people everywhere. But, you know, let's face it, it's mostly white people. Um, and they're largely country music fans. So I'm thinking, how are they going to receive this message? And it was the best feeling to, to get to that chorus and have everybody start cheering and realizing that, you know, there are so many like-minded people out there. Thank you. Yeah. My pleasure.